A Skytop passenger car gets a new look and an interior paint job coming up on JC's Rip Track. Hi there, my name is John and welcome to JC's Rip Track. If this is your first time here and you're looking for advice and tips on how to transform your plastic models into something that looks like it belongs on the rails today, click on subscribe and that little bell icon so you can be notified every time there's a new video. Have you ever tried painting the interior of a passenger car or a locomotive? How'd it go? Please let me know in the comment section down below. When I first set up my Patreon page, Marcel Verlure, known as Cloverdale Rail on YouTube, asked me if I could do a repaint of a passenger car rather than a weathering project for him. Now I'm always up for a challenge and as a result, Marcel became my first formal commission through my Patreon page. Some of you may have seen some pictures as it was updated, but most of them were for patron eyes only. So the project was to take this Walther's HO scale Hiawatha Skytop lounge car and transform it into a car that looked like it would have seen service on sea and rail as it would have looked in the early 1960s. When Marcel commissioned me, he wanted it as a lounge car and not as a sleeper, so I wouldn't have to do any rebuilding of the interior. Still, Marcel's idea was to have a Skytop lounge car in Canadian national colors, complete with a painted interior along with some passengers. Essentially, this was a fantasy scheme, and a special tribute of his part of it. He had some very specific requests about the passengers, which I will get into a little later. The first part was to almost completely dismantle the car. So this was more than simply removing the trucks, as I had to get at the interior to paint it and to add the passengers. The rear canopy came off first, followed by the sides, the roof, and the outside part of the vestibule at the front of the car. Once I had these off, I could look and see if there was any further part separation in order to make the painting process easier. However, the clear plastic for the windows on the side had been glued in, and the rear canopy was one entire piece of clear plastic that had been painted with the Hiawatha colors. Masking was definitely going to be a major part of this project. Now the second step was to prime the interior. It may be obvious to say this, but when working on any model with an interior, it is far better to paint these inside parts before assembling the rest of the model. It's far less work this way, and it allows for a lot more room for mistakes. Checking out the prototype photos and vintage video, Marcel and I decided that the interior colors would be red for the carpet, white for the walls, and blue for all the seating. Since these were bright colors, I primed the interior using Steinle Res's white primer using an airbrush. There was one interior clear plastic window that I would have to mask off before the white primer, but there would be a lot more masking that would come later. Once the primer had a chance to dry thoroughly, I carefully masked off the interior walls since they were already white. I wanted to keep them that way. I used Tamiya 6mm masking tape for most of this work. This can be a really tedious job, but ultimately any sort of airbrush work on any model will only be as good as the masking. It is worth it to sink the time into it. And here I used a pair of tweezers and a hobby knife to carefully move pieces into position. I found it best to pull out a strip of tape, stick it down to my cutting mat, and then cutting off shorter sections as I need them and then position them on the model. You're better to use several smaller pieces overlapped rather than trying to get the exact length. Now I did not film all of the masking process as it can be quite time consuming. Even then, I only chose to mask the walls but not the molded on chairs since I would be hand painting these later. Once the masking was done, airbrushing the carpet color was straightforward. I airbrushed AK Interactive Signal Red from the Real Colors line, thin with 91% alcohol. Even though this is an acrylic lacquer, because I had thinned it with alcohol, I painted the carpet the same way I would acrylics rather than lacquers. The idea is to lightly airbrush over the model, but not to try to get the coverage that I'm looking for all at once. Lightly spray on the area and then come back and gradually spray on more paint so that the coverage is even. This way, I reduce the risk of having the paint pool up too quickly when applying it. Painting the seats required a different approach. I chose to paint these by hand using Games Workshop Citadel line and even to demonstrate how their system can be used to get some nice looking results. I started by using Calgar Blue, which is a base paint. Citadel paints have several different types of paints within their line, and base paints are intended to be just that, to provide a base color over whatever primer color you've chosen to use. They go over black or white equally well and provide a solid color when applied. 
Using a layer brush, roughly the same size as a zero or one brush, I carefully painted all of the seats in the car, being very careful not to get any paint on the floor of the car. Since the walls were still masked off, I could be afford to be a little less precise there, but I still tried to keep it as clean as possible. Because these seats and the figures on them would be observed through the windows, I wanted to use a dramatic lighting trick on the seats that one could see the detail when looking through the clear plastic windows. Really, all this means is that I wanted to exaggerate the highlights on the edges of the seats so that the si they would look like more than just blue blobs. The Games Workshop paints are ideal for this and is very much the style of the models in that iteration of the hobby. Using layer paints in the same family as the base color, namely Alatoc and Half Blue, I used a smaller brush to paint the edges of the cushion and the tops of the chairs to make sure that these points would stand out. Alatoc Blue would be the first general highlight with Half Blue forming some details. Sometimes I find it helpful to mix the paints together to form an intermediate step, sometimes with the base color and sometimes with the highlights. Still, the end results were chairs that would stand out, especially with those that would remain unoccupied. And of course, what is a passenger car without passengers? And while there are a number of options that I could have considered, I opted to start with unpainted passengers from Walther's mainline series. Now in truth, this process was the single most time-consuming part of this project. Marcel had requested that regardless of how many passengers that would be in the car, that four of the figures would represent his son's family and they would be in the seats in the rear of the car, easily visible through the glass of the rear canopy. Ultimately, I decided to paint about 19 figures for the car. In all, there were room for nearly 36 if all the seats were filled. Going with about half to a third would have given the impression of an active car without it being too crowded. Still, the process of selecting, priming, and hand painting these figures took the largest amount of time in this whole project. So much so that I've decided to split the footage off and create a whole other video sharing the techniques of painting with those tiny little miniatures and the thought that goes behind it. So while I am sharing a couple of teasers of what that looked like, when I release that video, I'll put the link up in this corner. Once the figures were finished, I fixed them in place using a tiny bit of CA glue after first checking how they would fit in their respective seats. One thing that became pretty clear as I was getting ready to work on the exterior was that the CN Skytop cars would not have the Hiawatha nameplate across the rear of the car. Since it was molded into the rear canopy piece on the Walther's car, removing it would not be an option, so filling it in would be the way to go. Initially, I thought about using some siren strip with putty to fill in the gaps, but then I decided to just go with the putty itself. Before I did this, I had to get and use a number 80 drill bit so that I could mount the various grab irons before painting. In particular, since I was going to be applying putty over one area that would have a grab iron, I made sure to drill out the holes here so that I could then re-drill them from the inside once I had finished the putty work. I used Tamiya putty applied with a sculpting tool and smoothed across the area. The initial application would be very rough as all I was doing here was just getting enough there to get the contour right. Ultimately, I would be applying it, sanding it, reapplying it, and then re-sanding it, and then doing that until I got it smooth. Sometimes in applying it, I thinned it down with a bit of lacquer thinner, which helps in getting a smoother surface. However, during this early part of the process, I realized that I would need to mask off the windows before I did any more putty work, because I didn't want to risk getting that putty on the clear plastic. Plus, I would need to prime the model at a critical step to help me see what I missed, so I decided to try something new because masking off this canopy was going to take a lot of work and a really creative trick that I had picked up along the way. So now it was time to mask the windows. Masking the windows of the canopy was a particular challenge. As I said earlier, masking can be one of the most tedious things in the hobby, especially something with so many windows. There are a few different ways to do this, whether it is masking tape, masking fluid, or if you're lucky to have it, parafilm. However, I came across another trick that because it's so accessible, at least to me, that I would give it a try. Using the wrappers of Lindor chocolates. Specifically, I used wrappers from Lindor's milk chocolate truffles. 
And if you want a good excuse to buy chocolates, this one is pretty good. Just make sure get the red ones. Now, before I show you this technique, I need to give credit where credit is due. I first saw this on a Facebook page called The Empty Sprue, where it is used to mask off an airplane canopy. And what I'm showing here is almost exactly what I learned there. So the real credit for this belongs with Brian Medina at The Empty Sprue, including which wrappers do and don't work. And so I'm going to include a link to that Facebook page in the link down below. So here's how it works. Take an empty Lint Lindor Milk Chocolate Truffle Wrapper, one of the red ones. According to the Empty Sprue, black or blue wrappers don't work as well, if at all, so stick with the red ones. And how you empty that wrapper is up to you, but there's usually lots of volunteers when it comes to chocolate. Flatten the wrapper out and then carefully peel the foil backing away from the plastic. Sometimes it's a good idea to cut it to the approximate size that you will need before first peeling it. Place the peeled foil backing across the surface windows that you want to have masked and then gently press it into place and rub it first with your finger and then take a dense but soft sponge-like material to burnish it to the shape of where you want the mask to stay. I use the edge of one of those foam inserts that you can find in locomotive packages that hold the railings in place when first shipped. This worked the best for me, but you can try different ways of burnishing it down. Now this may take a while, but what you're looking for is to be able to see the details of the model, particularly the window edges through the foil. Now once this is done, take a brand new number 11 blade and gently and carefully cut along the edges of the foil, usually at the window's edge. At this point, all you're really doing is scoring the foil, but this is enough to cut it. The last step is then to carefully peel away the stuff that you don't want masked. And this you may need to cut a little bit more and it's always a good idea to do some more burnishing to the foil once you cut off the excess. And this forms a fantastic form-fitting mask that can be used with any kind of paint because the mask is made of metal. And as you can see here, it worked very well on both the canopy and the side windows of the car. And the canopy was all one piece, while the side windows were separate but glued into place. So this method works with both molded as well as two-piece glass. And I'll be using this method again, especially given the amount of practice that I got in with this car. Now, once I had finished masking everything off, I came back with a few more rounds of applying putty, letting it dry, sanding it smooth, and then checking it and applying more. To check my work, I then sprayed the canopy using Games Workshop's KS Black primer off camera, and then repeated the putty process, but thinned down with some lacquer thinner to get it to go on a bit smoother. Once this dried, I then sanded it down with increasingly finer grit sandpapers until I got the shape and the smoothness that I was looking for. And once this was done, I set about to glue the various grab irons into place. And it's amazing how this detail really adds to the model, even before the paint. There were two stirrups that I intentionally left off the model because they would interfere with the trucks on the tight curves, and I did this with Marcel's permission. Where I hadn't already done so, I used a number 80 drill bit to carefully drill out the holes and then place the appropriate size piece in place, securing it by holding it with tweezers and touching it to a tiny amount of CA glue, and then pushing it into the appropriate drilled out holes. Since I was going to be assembling the model in the next step, the orange plastic of the interior vestibule wall needed to be primed black. Using Steinle Res Black, I quickly sprayed this down before moving on to the next step. I would end up leaving this simply black without any painted detail, more as a stage lighting effect. I wanted to keep the area dark and not have too much attention drawn to it. Now it was time to get the car back together. The first thing that I had to do was install Rapido's Shorty Passenger Lighting Kit. In order to make it fit, I had to cut a small space out of the top interior walls of the car, and I did this off camera. 
I opted not to glue it in place so that the batteries could later be replaced and using the confines of the model to hold it in place. This lighting kit is activated using a magnetic wand held over the switch, which in this case was towards the rear of the car, just beside where the canopy joins the rest of the car. After this was done, I put the rest of the car back together, leaving off the trucks. I kept the diagram close at hand to make sure that I didn't miss anything. Now one significant step that you don't see me using on the car is using a spray can primer to paint the whole car black. It's out in my garage and it's not convenient to film. Games Workshop's Chaos Black is an excellent primer. It is a great deep black color on its own and receives any sort of paint really well. And the can sprays very well. Now I've tried various automotive primers and I keep coming back to Chaos Black, even if it costs a little bit more. It's definitely worth it no matter what model you're working on. Once the primer had dried, now came the task for masking off the model for the light gray markings. And this time around, I used Tamiya masking tape and yellow frog tape. In this case, I wanted to use the sharp and straight edge of the tape. I made sure to try to keep this masking tape off the foil wrapper masks on the windows, but there were some places where it was unavoidable, but it wasn't too much of a problem. Most of the masking I did off camera with the Tamiya regular model masking tape, but for the rear canopy, I used the newer Tamiya tape that is designed for curves. This was a much better option as the tape seemed to be made of a type of vinyl which can stick to curved surfaces a bit better or can alternatively provide a curved line on your mask if you need it. The stuff works well, I do recommend it. Once the masks were all in place, it was time to airbrush the stripes. As this was a Canadian national passenger car, I used Rapido Paints CN Lettering Grey. Since this was based on the actual prototype color, I couldn't get any more accurate than this. I find that the Rapido Paints thin well using Tamiya's X28 thinner, although 91% alcohol works just as well. When spraying an acrylic like this over black or any dark color, I found it much better, like I did with the interior, to do several light passes, misting the color over the surface, and then slowly building it up until it was opaque. This could give me a much more even coat. When combined with the black primer, the stripes of CN lettering gray was transformative and this now looked the part and just needed a few decals to punch it up. I gave it a coat of clear gloss, Future, to get it ready for them. Since one of the trucks would be also receiving decals, I also took the opportunity to spray both of them down. When preparing for this work, I ordered a set of decals from Black Cat Publishing. And while Black Cat did not have any decals for a Skytop in any configuration, Marcel and I worked out that the Cove series would work the best and the car would be known as Beaver Cove with an appropriate road number. I applied the decals with the, my usual method, applying it over a glossy surface using Microset, letting it dry before applying Microsol, and then repeating the step if necessary. I also made sure to then seal them in with a brush on gloss varnish before the final spray on coat. Passenger cars are usually fairly glossy affairs. They're well polished and most of the in-service pictures that we could find of the existing Skytops in CN's fleet saw them with a fairly shiny finish. Still, this would be in scale, so a satin coat would still be the best bet, as a gloss finish on models of this size and smaller don't really scale all that well. If something is supposed to be fairly glossy in real life, you're still most likely best to be using a satin coat. Unlike virtually any of the other cars on this channel, this passenger car would have minimal weathering. Passenger cars are usually fairly shiny affairs with only the underside showing any degree of fading dirt or other forms of weathering. To handle this, I used a pair of Ammo by Meg's oil brushes to apply a simple two color dot fade to the underside sections of the car, as well as the yet to be attached trucks. The oil brushes are really cut down on time because all I had to do was apply them directly to the bottle with the built in applicator brush.
Once I had applied the dots, I then blended them with a brush using odorless thinner. And while this was drying, I then hand brushed Steinal Res Red Brown Primer into the facings of the wheels to give them a more prototypical look. Now the last step was to go back and remove the foil mask from the windows, and this required a bit of care using the edge of a number 11 blade and tweezers as well as a small pin. And while it took time, the payoff was ultimately worth it. The masks worked perfectly and the paint around the windows had a razor sharp edge. And finally, the last step was to attach and reassemble the trucks, and at long last, this project was done. Now this was a great project. While this isn't my usual fare of a rust and grime, transforming this passenger car into something personal for Marcel was fun to do. It was also by far the most time consuming project that I have so far worked on. And the real challenge for this episode was cutting down hours and hours worth of footage to show here and realizing that I would be better to save the painting of the passengers for another video and another one going into a bit more detail on the chocolate wrapper masking. So watch for both of those coming soon. So I do hope you found this helpful, and the major takeaway from this project is using something that you might not expect to great effect, namely a chocolate wrapper to make extremely effective masks for complex window patterns. Don't be afraid to try out some new things, even if those things seem to come from very unexpected places. Besides, how often does a modeling project encourage you to go buy and eat chocolate? So if you want to get more tips on how to get the most out of your weathering and painting projects, don't forget to hit subscribe and that little bell icon so you won't miss any upcoming videos. Also, if you haven't already, check out the other videos on this channel as well as some of the social media links down below. Also, if you liked seeing how Marcel's commission went and you want a chance to see how one of your own might look, then go check out my Patreon page and you can get involved in the creative process for this channel. So thanks so much for watching. Good luck and may you keep on track.